everyone, today I'm drawing a vampire couple. You can listen to what I'm going to tell you while you watch a drawing on the screen. I would like to talk about an umbrella term that encompasses all these concepts such as horror themed moments, movies, books, etc. Which is gothic. In the simplest form, we use this adjective to describe the girls we see outside who dress in black, who are cool, right? It even started to be mentioned in memes on social media. In other words, it's not an unknown rare word. The most well known is gothic architecture. So how does wearing black and gothic architecture relate to this dark and depressive state? I thought about this a lot before I started researching these topics. Because from the outside, gothic makeup, clothes, lifestyle and gothic architecture don't seem to be directly connected. I thought there had to be a chain of events, a cause and effect relationship within the historical process. When you don't research anything, you just guess in your head, hmm, gothic churches, religion, Christianity. So what does that have to do with black leather clothes what does it have to do with the style of these characters originating in 12th century france the gothic style was actually named this way much later at the time these buildings were called opus francigenium meaning french work starting with the basilica of saint denis in paris in 1144 the style spread to Germany later. In short, we can't say that France and Germany are the cradle of this style. Before Gothic architecture, buildings were built in the Roman style, expanding horizontally. In the Gothic style, there is a vertical elongation. The buildings rise towards the sky. Windows of gigantic size, arches that intersect each other. The feeling one wants to give to those who see these structures is divinity. In other words, a religious understanding of art is adopted. The structures tapering towards the sky give the impression of a gateway to heaven. By the way, Hogwarts building is an example of Gothic architecture. Gothic architecture is a dominant architectural concept from the Middle Ages until the Renaissance, that is, until the 16th century. Traditional church architecture is changing. What we now call church architecture becomes building Gothic cathedrals. In time, noble families built their castles in this style. The purpose of this is to frighten and intimidate the poor lower classes. In other words, when we say Gothic architecture, it belongs to the Middle Ages, the feudal periods. A pre-enlightenment style. I'm not actually saying this, the Renaissance is saying this. Because with the enlightenment period, these structures start to be found horrible. Since the Renaissance embraced ancient Greece and classicism, these structures are extremely contrary to the aesthetic understanding of the people of the period. That's why they call these buildings Gothic, which means descended from the gods. First person to use this term was Giorgio Vasari, an Italian painter, architect and art critic. In other words, he actually uses this word to denigrate these structures because the word itself refers to the barbaric northern Germanic tribes. These tribes were also loot in Rome in the 400s and 500s. The gods were barbarians in the eyes of the Romans because they were not Romans or they were not Christians. Their art was as ugly as themselves. So when Giorgio Vasari said Gothic, he coined this term with this causality in mind. These cathedrals too had the spread of the Gothic grotesques in their appearance. Architecturally, this is the story of Gothic. Already with the Renaissance, other architectural moments emerged. Gothic architecture is a thing of the past, until the Gothic revival in the 1700s. And Gothic is on the rise again, this time not in architecture but in literature. This revival is occurring because the industrial revolution has radically changed the economic and social life, the relationship between society and the individual. The criticism of the monotonous human and the dominance of intelligence triggers the romantic moment in England. In fact, the trigger for the Gothic revival was the romantic period. Now, first of all, we need to understand this romantic period. It would also be in historical order. 
In the 18th century, in a time of dizzying changes, people of course find it hard to keep up. A period in which the Renaissance and the humanism phases were overcome and the French Revolution took place. This revolution is one of the caveman's that gave romanticism its soul. This revolution means the destruction of the absolute monarchy and the destruction of the existing social structure. It's also an incident that calls into question the feelings of nationalism. It was a period when each community began to claim their own nation and return to their own identity. Along with the idea of freedom, the idea of individualism gains importance. The every human being is an individual understanding emerged. Of course, what we call the French Revolution did not just happen and then a super state of France was established. After the revolution, there was a period of terror and the revolutionaries who seized government executed even those who opposed them from within. There is an incredible wave of paranoia in the public. It's a very complicated period, but to summarize, there were five different periods between 1789 to 1815. There are political imbalances. In other words, there was a revolution, but it didn't produce results that met the expectation of the people. They can't go back. How could they look to the future with hope in this mess? Naturally, this atmosphere influenced the feelings of poets, writers and painters and shaped the spirit of the period. Pessimism, sadness, melancholy dominate the works. The sadness that dominates the works is called the diseases of the century. You know how today there is a talk of loneliness as the diseases of our age? The fact that people were melancholic and sad at the time was the subject of such discourses. There is also the theme of escape. Writers often deal with this theme, they want to leave that place, they don't want to be there. They want to go to other lands, they felt so helpless, so hopeless. To better understand the spirit of this period, you can simply read the novels of artists such as Goethe, Victor Hugo and Alexander Dumas. Of course, Romanticism is not only a moment that emerged with the French Revolution, it's not only about that. For example, Goethe is also included in the Romanticism moment, but he began to write long before the French Revolution. In fact, he is included in German Romanticism moments. Sturm und Drang also known as the age of genius or the period of genius, refers to the literary moment of the age of enlightenment from about 1767 to 1785, composed mainly of young writers between the ages of 20 and 30. The young French writers struggle against the aristocratic court culture and their sympathy for abstract concepts such as nature, the heart and the people attracted to the attention of their German contemporaries. At this point, it would be great to talk about classicism. Because romanticism is actually a moment born out of the desire to break the rigid rules of classicism to oppose it. Classicism belongs to the upper classes and its language is as artificial as possible. It doesn't contain text that the public can read. How far do these texts reach the public anyway? So when things are written and drawn, the only customer mass is the nobility. But as the development of the printing press and the increase in the speed of the printing made it easier for the works to reach the readers, the readership expanded. Whereas previously on the nobility and aristocrats could read them, now the common people can read them too. What does that mean? Now the public is also an audience that is addressed. In this case, there is a need for works that tell about them and are written for them. The understanding of art is for the people emerges. This is also the origin of Romanticism. A word derived from the word Romance and a corrupted variant of Latin meaning the language spoken by the people in Roman times. Later on, it came to be known as a genre of poetry and prose full of extraordinary elements that attracted the public. Over time, the word Romantic evolved to mean something reminiscent of the old chivalric novels, the age of the read poets. That's where the romance comes from. Classicism was the art of the period of absolute monarchy, romanticism was the opposite. Now the language of the work is becoming more accessible to the public. In addition, 
everything that concerns society and human beings also concerns literature. Instead of the purely intellectual ideas of classicism, the reader now encounters personal thoughts based on the intuition and emotion. This tendency towards emotion, which the Romanticism moment revealed, was also a precursor to the Gothic literature that would emerge later. Of course, romance has emerged in other lands first. Where does it start? At a school in England. The School of Feeling, the precursor of Romanticism in England. Founded by Anthony Ashley Cooper, the schools teach that reason alone is not enough to discern good and evil, and that emotions are better at discerning good and evil. He sees civilization separated from nature, materialism, urbanization as the source of evil. With school comes a longing for the past, a longing for the pre-industrial revolution. For Britain, this manifests itself as a longing for the English Middle Ages. Written by Horace Walpole in 1764, The Castle of Otranto is known as the first Gothic novel and carries traces of the past. This novel reflects a longing for ancient times. From this, we can say that the pioneer of Gothic revival was England. There are actually many reasons why the Gothic revival period started. First, the Gothic style, which was seen in religious buildings until the 18th century, begins to be seen in secular buildings. Because it was the first country to carry out the industrial revolution, it tried to underline its greatness by using Gothic style. This is an architectural revival. Its reflection in literature is an expression of the longing for the old against the modernity and enlightenment I mentioned earlier. Although architecture seems to come to the fore in Gothic novels, it's actually about human beings and the human mind. Yes, the novels feature ruined castles, dark dungeons, creepy and dazzled settlements, abandoned houses, factories, hospitals, schools and cramped rooms, but that's not all there is to the Gothic novel. So we cannot define it like this. If the work is set in a Gothic castle, it's a work of Gothic literature. We call it a Gothic novel because it adopts the Gothic style of architecture. We call it Gothic novel because it adopts the Gothic style of architecture. That would be a very shallow definition. The main reason why castles are preferred is not simply because they are built in the Gothic style. There is an element of fear in the possibility of the return of the old feudal order when the nobility ruled. Horace Walpole and Anne Radcliffe, two pioneers of the Gothic novel, mentioned Edmund Burke's work in the prefaces of their works. The title of this work is A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful. In this project, Edmund Burke argues that people do not only find pleasure in the beautiful, in beautiful emotions and objects, but can also find pleasure in obscure or horrible. He argues that when a person is outside of real danger or pain, the thought of pain and danger can give him pleasure. So he talks about the imaginary fear of danger creating a pleasurable sensation. And this is already catharsis. In fact, Gothic writers were not the first to explore the state of finding pleasure in negative emotions. Romantic artists also draw a sad profile who enjoy suffering, who don't know how to be happy. There are also sad depictions of nature in their works. There are depictions of moonlight, shadows, a dramatic autumn atmosphere. The allegorical diversity of the medieval imagination and its world of uncanny images, many of which leave the impression of not belonging to this world, are perfect for romantics who are deeply pessimistic due to the atmosphere of the time. It appeals very much to their melancholic personalities. At this point, Gothic literature inherits from Romantic literature both the products of uncanny imagination and pessimism. In other words, Gothic is a dark interpretation of Romantic literature. It combines supernatural elements from folk literature with the new narrative techniques of modern literature. After the discovery of the enjoyment of horror, or more precisely, after the discovery that horror was marketable, the Gothic trend began in England between 1760s and 1850s. Almost 600 Gothic works were published 
during this period. Everyone writes creepy stories. Gothic literature, like romantic literature, is the result of a sensitivity to the individual and social mood of this period, a sensitivity that embraces people's fears and anxieties. Events such as the French Revolution, industrialization and urbanization are dizzying events. In every century, such fears and worries affect the mood of humanity. Isn't there concern even now that is the future AI will take over our lives. It's like this. Their influence in art reflects this. The results are romantic literature, gothic literature. When we look at the period, we see design developments. It's also a time when the thirst for knowledge is at its peak. It's also a time when the thirst for knowledge is at its peak. The industrial revolution, urbanization, one invention after another. Humanity is also worried about its future. What will happen and what will end of is unknown. Because in the end, it's all unknown. The unknown is also frightened. At that time, the approach to this situation included discourses such as Don't try to uncover the unknown. You can't defy nature. I mean, yes, technological developments and science are good things, but there is also a thought that people should not go too far. Otherwise, we cannot know the consequences. We cannot cope. This is also very common in Gothic novels. In other words, invasion of privacy and access to forbidden information are being committed. As seen, for example, in Mary Shelley's famous novel Frankenstein, protagonists who seek powers and knowledge that are supposed to remain secret or that are attributed only to God end up disappointed or in even more trouble. The main idea of the book is that one should not rely too much on reason and science. The book says, that while science is a good thing, some things should not be taken too far. At the same time, the Gothic emerged at a time when emotions are suppressed for fear of gaining a respectable place in society. In the picture of Dorian Gray, for example, he tells the story of a person who succumbs to the sadistic and sexual desires he hides inside. The horror element in the Gothic novel also deals with the situation of the repressed finally coming to light. There is a concept that Heimlich Unheimlich is translated as familiar, uncanny. Heim means home in German. It also means familiar, private and secret. In this case, Unheimlich means the disappearance of secrecy, that which is revealed when it should have remained a secret. That is where the fear comes from. Because in Gothic novels, situations such as violation of privacy and access to forbidden information are pursued. An example of fear is when we see through people we think we are familiar with. Like the venerable father Ambrosio in The Monk, by Matthew Gregory Lewis, who sold his soul to the devil. The artistic phenomenon called Gothic goes through a journey from the barbaric tribes I mentioned at the beginning of the video to the church, from the churches to the romantic period, and then to the Gothic revival in England and becomes an expression of repressed emotions fears and the darker aspects of human nature. What I will explain in a moment is that it's actually the success it has achieved in literature and cinema that has caused this subject to become a subculture. Think about it, Edgar Allan Poe is one of the most important names spoken when we say Gothic literature. He is a pioneer of American Gothic literature and his works have more supernatural themes such as death, resurrection and ghosts. There is also the concept of crime that urbanization brings with it. So there are detective stories that go into the city as gothic. Dracula, written by Bram Stoker in 1897, is considered to be the ancestor of all the vampire movies we watch today. Oscar Wilde and Lord Byron are also artists who still inspire gothic literature today. In fact, these names I mentioned have very strange connections among themselves. Mary Shelley and Lord Byron were in the same environment, people who know each other. There are accounts of Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley and Lord Byron being stranded in the same mansion by the storm 
and writing their most famous works. Apart from that, Poe's personal life is very strange and his death is very suspicious. So these are uncanny people, mysterious personalities, but that's the topic for another video. Now I would like to talk about the gothic subculture which is the last stop of this journey. I want to talk about how it has become a lifestyle among young people. Until the 1970s, God starts to be used in the stance of grotesque, mysterious, dazzled with the influence of literature. The subculture we call God also emerged in the early 80s, influenced by punk. In fact, for the young generation of that period, the gothic style, just like the young generation that embraced the punk movement, turned into the expression of certain emotions through the masses coming together. They are also represented in music bands like Sisters of Mercy, Susie and the Banshees, Cure and Bauhaus are the most basic examples. Just as rappers, rockers or metalheads listen to the music and adopt the lifestyle that best represents them and in which they find themselves, gods adopt the dark, dramatic, romantic, uncanny and follow and consume all kinds of books, movies, TV series and fashion trends that fit this theme. That's how much sense it makes. Didn't we get emo when we were 13? Remember the emos? It must be 2009 or something. I wish I had a photo so I could put it here. My haircut was emo. Everyone was doing their hair like that. It's like the latest version of gothic. There is even a South Park episode about it. I recommend you watch this. I'll even drop a link at the bottom. In that episode, emos are an embarrassment to the gods and they have an attitude like you have disgraced our subculture, you adolescent emos. Because the consciousness that gothic culture inherits comes from the literary classics of the medieval Victorian and Edwardian in a more elite, more noble position. Look at vampires, they are all lords. I will explain this vampire theme as a continuation of this video, don't miss it either. I hope it was an enjoyable video. I hope you enjoy listening and watching at least as much as I did. While I was telling you all this, I drew a picture of a vampire couple. In the second part, I will paint this picture and explain where the concept of the vampire originated and how it's processed today. Stay tuned for the upcoming video, then see you in part two. Bye!